Happy Sabbath, uh, everyone, wherever you are tuning in. We glorify the name of the Lord for another great moment and opportunity to be able to look into his word. And uh, the, the week has uh, been uh, kind of fine. And uh, when the Sabbath comes, we draw nigh to God and forget all about these things that uh, really trouble us and uh, focus on that uh, most uh, important thing, which is uh, giving praise, honor, and glory to our Heavenly Father for all the things that uh, he has enabled us to go through. It is by his strength that uh, we are able to breathe and uh, move and do all the things that we do. And so we don't have uh, a reason per se uh, why we should be complaining of anything because uh, the, the Lord has been so good and gracious unto us. And so I just want to welcome you, those people, wherever you are, uh, who are in the Sabbath of the Lord, that uh, happy Sabbath and uh, may the blessings of the Lord uh, rest uh, upon all of you as um, we seek his uh, uh, face uh, today. Now, we have been going through um, the series of uh, a need for Sabbath reform. And uh, in part seven, we were looking, uh, we started looking at the different roles of different people in the church during the Sabbath. And we started with the parents and touched a little bit about the children. And uh, Right now, I want us to look at uh, the role of the church, what, um, what it should be able to play during the Sabbath hours and to make uh, the Sabbath a delightful day, a day of rejoicing, a day that uh, we shall not um, make the angels of God fold their wings and uh, record uh, um against us anything, but uh, they'll rejoice being in our presence. They'll fellowship with us. And when they get back to heaven with the report, it will be a good report. And so I just like to give thanks to the Lord and uh, then uh, we can be able to continue with the session. Shall we give thanks? Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much. You have been so good unto us as a family, as a uh, a person individually. And as a church, we haven't had anything bad. Lord, we thank you because of the gift of life. Many have rested, but we are still alive to say thank you. And uh, words can fail us because some things of the heart can be expressed in words, but it's just a feeling of joy inside us. We thank you because Christ is coming soon to take his church home. We want to be part of that uh, company that will say, this is the Lord whom we have waited upon and he has come to save us. And so as we even come to a conclusion of this uh, a series on a need of a Sabbath reform, Lord, it is not that everything has been exhausted, but your spirit will continue communing with your children and uh, bring in the information, revival and power and the grace that is needed to do the necessary reforms in at such a time as this. May you accept uh, our thanksgiving this day, and may this Sabbath be a light unto all of your children around the world. In Christ Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. And so uh, I'd like to speak about uh, the role of the church. Um, during the Sabbath hours, how the church can make it uh, a delightful day, how the church can make the Sabbath hours be more interesting and uh, be appreciated in every way. And so it is my prayer that um, the Lord will continue reviving his church. The Lord will continue communing with us individually and give us the strength to make sure that we do this um, reforms that he's calling us to do. And I'd like to share my screen so that uh, 
we may be blessed together. <clears throat> and I remember we are looking at the role of the church. What is the role of the church? Previously, we look at uh, the role of the parents during the Sabbath hours and what they are supposed to do. But now we go ahead and look at the role of the church. In uh, Child Guidance, page uh, 542, paragraph 2, we are told, um, do not have so little reverence for the house and worship of God as to communicate with one another during the sermon. If those who commit this fault will see the angels of God looking upon them and marking their doings, they will be filled with shame and abhorrence of themselves. God wants attentive hearers. It was while men slept that the enemy sowed tears. And so when uh, we come in the presence of the Lord and we are busy talking one to his neighbor, one to her neighbor, the children and all that, the church members are in a state of confusion so that uh, they cannot hear the voice of the Lord speaking. This is the way walking in it. And so we are told in the Bible that uh, we are in the presence of the Lord. Let the whole earth keep silent in the book of Zechariah. And so when we come in the presence of the Lord as church members, we have each and everyone a duty to make sure that silence is maintained in the house of God. And everything appropriate is done in time and in place, rather than involving ourselves in the things that will not be approved of God. Continues to say in 542.1, the moral test of the worshippers in God's holy sanctuary must be elevated, refined, sanctified. This matter has been sadly neglected. It is, it is importance, it is importance has been overlooked, and as the result, disorder and irreverence have become prevalent, and God has been dishonored. When the leaders in the church Ministers and people, fathers and mothers, have not had elevated views of this matter. What could be expected of the inexperienced children? They are too often found in groups away from the parents who should have charge over them. Notwithstanding, they are in the presence of God and his eye is looking upon them. They are light and trifling, they whisper and laugh, are careless, irreverent, and inattentive. So <clears throat> the behavior of uh, the adults in the church really is passed on to the inexperienced children. And you find that the things that the adults um, uh, do in church during the Sabbath hours, you will find the inexperienced and little children doing them either in church or outside the church. And so we may be sure that uh, whatever thing that uh, we are doing will not pass a bad example to the new converts and to the children who are inexperienced. And also uh, in uh, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 5, page 492, when worshipers enter the place of meeting, they should do so with decorum passing quietly to their seats. If there is a stove, a stove in the room, it is not proper to crowd upon it in an intolerant way. Careless attitude, common talking, whispering, and laughing should not be permitted in the house of worship, either before or after the service. Ardent, active piety should characterize the worshippers. 5T for 92, paragraph 1. If some have to wait a few minutes before the meeting begins, let them maintain a true spirit of devotion by silent meditation, keeping the heart uplifted to God in prayer that the service may be of special benefit to their own hearts and lead to the conviction and conversion of other souls. They should remember that heavenly messengers are in the house. We all lose much sweet communion with God by our restlessness, by not encouraging moments of reflection and prayer. The spiritual condition needs to be often reviewed and the mind and heart drawn toward the sun of righteousness. 
if when the people come into the house of worship, they have genuine reverence for the Lord and bear in mind that they are in his presence, there will be a sweet eloquence in silence. The whispering and laughing and talking, which might be without sin in a common business place, should find no sanction in the house where God is worshipped. The mind should be prepared to hear the word of God that it may have due weight and suitably impress the heart. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 492, paragraph 2. Now, allow me to reflect on this a little bit. Before and after the sermon, we are being told that uh, silence will be maintained and piety and reverence and uh, an attitude of meditation to think about the things we have heard so that they may make an impression in our hearts. But um, many times you find that before the sermon, people are in talking, they are not preparing their hearts to ask the Lord anything that shall be spoken in this service. Lord, let it touch my life and let it uh, uh, change my whole being uh, in a spiritual way. And even after the sermon, you find that people talk things that are not related to the sermon at all. And so the value of the sermon is lost by this uh, talking that is out of place. People having discussions that uh, are not geared towards uh, remembering even what was spoken. And we are living in solemn moments when the voice of the Lord, when it's not heard among us, then we are bound to be lost. But people don't care that they are in the presence of God and God is speaking through his channels so that they may be prepared for the great events that are before us. And so we come into the Sabbath and we live more worse than we came into it because we were not attentive to listen to the voice of God speaking to our hearts. And this has turned into a curse more than a blessing. And the Sabbath to many has been a day like any other day that uh, you can go and listen to something, anything that you want and uh, still be a Christian. So the role of the church and the church members, when the minister enters, it should be with a dignified solemn mind. He should bow down in silent prayer as soon as he steps into the pulpit and honestly ask help of God. What an impression this will make there will be solemnity and awe upon the people. Their minister is communing with God. He is committing himself to God before he dares to stand before the people. Solemnity rests upon all and angels of God are brought very near. Everyone of the congregation also who fears God should with bowed head unite in silent prayer with him that God may grace the meeting with his presence and give power to his truth proclaimed from human lips. When the meeting is opened by prayer, every knee should bow in the presence of the Holy One, and every heart should ascend to God in silent uh, devotion. The prayer of uh, faithful worshipers will be heard, and the ministry of the word will prove effectual. The lifeless attitude of the worshippers in the house of God is one great reason why the ministry is not more productive of good. The melody of song poured forth from many hearts in clear, distinct utterance is one of God's instrumentalities in the work of saving souls. All the service should be conducted with solemnity and awe as in the visible presence of the master of assembly. So uh, it is the duty of every minister when he enters into the church before the service begins to bow down on his knees and offer silent prayer unto the Lord and the congregation should join in and offer prayer for the minister so that it may prepare their hearts and the hearts of the minister. This is the only way the evil angels can be kept in check so that the minister may not speak of his own things or the seed that is uh, sown may not fall on thorny ground where actually it will be choked when uh, it is not cultivated. And so this is something that is not practiced so much, but it is something we are looking at the need for Sabbath reform. And these are the things that uh, the Lord is asking us to be doing if we will get the blessings of the Sabbath. 
In Patrick's and Prophet, page 307, paragraph 3, God has given men six days where into labor and it requires that their own work be done in the six working days. Acts of necessity and mercy are permitted on the Sabbath. The sick and suffering are at all times to be cared for, but unnecessary labor is to be strictly avoided. So let not the church as a whole or the church members think that uh, because the Sabbath is a day meant to doing good, they will um, uh, decide that um, the day to carry on the activities of visiting the sea and uh, going to visit the needy is the Sabbath. You know, we avoid doing the work of the, of the Lord through the week and come and pile it on the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is so packed, the people get so tired and uh, the moral sensibilities are benumbed so that they may not be able to hear the voice of the Lord speaking to them. It should be a day that uh, uh, the people will have a time to reflect uh, what the Lord would want them to do in their life. It's, it's not a day that should be packed a lot that we forget that uh, we are in the presence of a holy God who wants to commune with us individually and as a child. And so uh, as we look upon how the Sabbath has been conducted and uh, how the parents have behaved, how the church members have behaved, we find that we are wanting in the balances of the sanctuary. The good thing in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, we are told that there is no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus, who are called by his name. And so the reason why the Lord speaks to us with his tenderest voice, as he speaks to us right now, is so that we may reform our ways. He has done everything that is good unto us, and what does he ask of us but to obey him? to reverence him and to love him. There is no other service that you can offer to God than to love him with all your heart and with all your mind. But um, we kind of think that God is our brother whom we can just do anything and everything in his presence and be excused. We sin with impunity uh, in that we think that the grace of God is so much that at the end of the day, he will not punish the wrongdoers. But this is the time to hear the voice of the Lord so that when he visits sinners, we may not be numbered among us, the sinners. Now, that is the role of the church, that uh, it should maintain piety, reverence, silence, no unnecessary jesting and talking during the Sabbath hours. And uh, before the sermon and after the sermon, there should be a time of reflection, a time of meditation, what has been spoken. What is God trying to speak to me individually? What is God trying to tell his church? If we can uh, put ourselves in a position that uh, we will hear the voice of the Lord, many things that we have never known shall be revealed unto us. In fact, in the book of uh, Jeremiah 33 verses 2, we are told that, um, call unto me and I'll show you things that you have never known. But we barely call on uh, our heavenly father. We go in his presence. We are in a hurry. We are inattentive. We are of much noise. Our children are running up and down. We cannot sit in silence. We are conversing. We are on our phones and all that stuff. Until the Lord in heaven says that I went and sought even if there is one who is uh, uh, listening or one who is uh, ready to seek me, but I found none. Let, let that not be said of, uh, uh, of us when we go to worship the Lord on the Sabbath. Now, that is the role of the church. What is the role of the leaders? What is the role of the leaders? The role of the leaders. We read that uh, the Lord has a controversy with his professed people in these last days, and this controversy men in responsible positions will take a course directly opposite to, the, to that pursued by Nehemiah. They will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but they will try to keep it from others by burying it beneath the rubbish of custom and tradition. In churches and in large gatherings in the open air, Ministers will urge the people to ne the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. There are calamities on the sea and land, and these calamities will increase one disaster following close upon another. 
and the little band of conscientious Sabbath keepers will be pointed out as the ones who are bringing the wrath of God upon the world by their disregard of Sunday. This is Revere and Herald, March 18, 1884, paragraph 8. And so as um, the ministers, the religious ministers are telling their congregation and urging them to keep Sunday, and the Lord has a controversy with them, let it not be found among us who are Sabbath keepers to be as leaders discrediting the Sabbath. And how can the leaders discredit the Sabbath? It is for this reason that the house or sanctuary dedicated to God should not be made a common place. Leaders should stand strong. It is sacredness should not be confused or mingled with common everyday feeling, feelings or business life. There should be a solemn awe upon the worshippers as they enter the sanctuary and they should leave behind all common worldly thoughts for it is the place where God reveals his presence. It is as the audience chamber of the great and eternal God, therefore pride and passion, dissension and self-esteem, selfishness and covetousness, which God pronounce idolatry, are inappropriate for such a place. Ministers should avoid pride, passion, dissension, self-esteem, selfishness, covetousness. These are all forms of idolatry and God will have none of it, ministers should make sure that there are no debates during the Sabbath hours. They should take charge to give symbol lessons uh, of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Savior, his saving power, and his um, justification of the sinners. No place should be given to the ministers to show that um, there are more or more important than even the church members. And ministers are also advised that all should be taught in child guidance, page 544, paragraph two. All should be taught to be neat, clean, and orderly in their dress, but not to indulge in that external adorning which is wholly inappropriate for the sanctuary. There should be no display of the apparel, for this encourages irreverence. All matters of dress should be strictly guarded, following closely the Bible rule. Fashion has been the goddess who has ruled the outside world, and she often insinuates herself into the church. The church should make the word of God her standard, and parents should think intelligently upon this sub subject. And so uh, we are told that ministers and church members and the children should guard this issue of irreverence in display of apparel. And uh, neither is it the object of preaching to amuse. The preachers are standing between the heaven and the earth, the living and the dead. They are not called to be comedians on the pulpit. Some ministers have adopted a style of preaching that has not the best influence. It has become a habit with them to weave anecdotes into their discourses. The impression thus made upon the hearers is not a save of life unto life. Ministers should not bring amusing stories into their preaching. The people need pure preventer, thoroughly winnowed from the chaff. Preach the word was the charge that Paul gave to Timothy, and this is our commission also. The minister who mixes storytelling with his discourses is using strange fire. God is offended and the cause of truth is dishonored when his representative descend to the use of cheap, trifling words. This is Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 318, paragraph one. The anecdotes and uh, the storytelling of uh, things that are not true in nature. Many people will point to Jesus Christ using the parables and they will want to weave in their own stories in discourses. But um, from inspiration, we find that Jesus Christ spoke of real things the parables that he spoke are things which were happening in Israel and he or his hearers could see them happening in the vicinity as he spoke about them. He didn't speak of fairy tales that uh, had no place to convert the souls. And so even in the children's stories, we are told we have enough Bible stories that the children can be told. The stories of hares, lions, and hyenas and not the story to occupy the minds of the children, telling them of fairy tales. And when they ask of these things, you tell, you tell them that this is not reality, but nonetheless, it uh, is good to tell them. No, 
we are not to become Shakespeare's. We are called to be ministers of gospel. We are not called to be comedians on the pulpit. We are living in the days when the children of God needs meat in due season. The present truth where Christ is and what he's doing and what is about to happen on the face of the earth. If we take the chance that we have been given to misuse it and uh, speak of the things that will not bring the solemnity of what Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary, many will take the gospel to be something so cheap. At the end of the day, they'll play around and be found wanting in the balance of the sanctuary. And in that day, we are told that uh, the church members shall hold upon their pastors telling them, why didn't you tell us these things? And they shall tear them apart because they are the ones who didn't take the matter seriously with them and uh, lead them to Christ. Again, uh, we are told um, as leaders, there should be a sacred spot like the sanctuary of all where God is to meet with his people. That place should not be used as a lounge room or a business room, but simply for the worship of God. When children attend day school in the same place where they assemble to worship on the Sabbath, they cannot be made to feel the sacredness of this place and that they must end up with feelings of reverence. The sacred and common are so blended that it is difficult to distinguish them. And so you find that many take the churches to use them as business rooms, lounge rooms, and the places of children learning. A church school needs to be built. There shouldn't be no church property that is used as a business room or the place of worship as a lounge room. These things calls for a greater discipline and the leaders in church need to stand for the truth, whether the heavens or the earth fall. Prophets and Kings, page 94, paragraph one. How sad, how filled with significance the words and all Israel with him. The people whom God had chosen to stand as a light to the surrounding nations were turning from their source of strength and seeking to become like the nations about them. As with Solomon, so with Rehoboam. The influence of wrong example lead many astray. And as with them, so to a greater or less degree is it today with everyone who gives himself up to work evil. The influence of wrongdoing is not confined to the doer. No man liveth unto himself. None perish alone in their iniquity. Every life is a light that brightens and cheers the pathway of others or a dark and desolating influence that tends toward despair and ruin. We lead others either upward to happiness and immortal life or downward to sorrow and eternal death. And if by our deeds we strengthen or force into activity the evil powers of those around us, we share in their sin. And so ministers and leaders in church have to make sure that they are not lowering the standard. In the lowering of the standard, they can think that it is only them who are being affected, but the whole church is being affected. And one sinner, many sinners. When in Israel, one person did something which was wrong, the presence of God was withholding from them. Until the accursed thing was taken away from them, the people were in danger of perishing by the presence of the Lord. And so sometimes, you know, we do what we do and we think that uh, it is only us who, is, who are doing the thing or the thing is confined to us, but no one liveth unto himself. Our life impacts others who are looking unto us. And uh, I'm not saying that we have to be idols to people, but then we have to be very careful because we are examples to other people. We are examples and we are role models to other people. And so if we do not do the right things as leaders and ministers of the gospel, others take it for granted that if the minister can do that, how much about me uh, I'm not uh, needed to do more than what I should do. And so like Nehemiah, in those days saw so I in Judah, some trading wine press on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and landing as, is all, as also wine, grapes and figs and all man of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, and I testified against them in the day wherein they sold. Victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all man of ware and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus 
did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet he bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said unto them, why lodge ye about the wall? If you do so again, I lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. That is um, the book of um, Nehemiah chapter 13 verses 15 to 22. We should have the Nehemiahs of today who are ready to contend for the right and for the sanctity of the Sabbath without wavering a minute. And so let us keep all businesses matters out of the house of the Lord on the Sabbath. And let us make sure that uh, there is no frivolous joking. There is no storytelling. And there are no things that um, the ministers that will do that um, will make people think that um, the Sabbath is a day to joke around with. And so as uh, we go into the last part of it, we read that in, uh, in uh, Evangelism page 110, the minister is using strange fire when he mixes storytelling with his discourses. You have men of all classes of minds to meet. And as you deal with sacred word, you should manifest earnestness, respect, reverence. Let not the impression be made upon any mind that you are a cheap surface speaker. Weed out storytelling from your discourses. Preach the word. You will have had more shields to bring to the master if you head constantly preach the good word. You little understand the soul's great need and longing. Some are wrestling with doubt, almost in despair, almost hopeless. In Christ Triumphant, page 255, paragraph one, on a certain occasion when Betterton, the celebrated actor, was dining with Dr. Sheldon, Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop said to him, pray, my Mr. Betterton, tell me why it is that you act as affect your audience so powerfully by speaking of things imaginary. My Lord, reply Betterton, with due submission to your grace, permit me to say that the reason is plain. It all lies in the power of enthusiasm. We on the stage speak of things imaginary as if they were real, and you in the pulpit speak of things real as if they were imaginary. And so we seem so cheap in our preaching. We seem so unreal in our preaching that an impression is not left on the hearts of men and women who are seeking Jesus Christ. But the actors in a whole, they speak imaginary things as if they were real until, until the minds of the people imagine these things until they become a reality in their lives and they pursue them. But uh, we don't do the same. It's like uh, a power has been robbed from us. And why has a power been robbed from us? It is because uh, we have not taken spiritual things seriously as they should be taken. We have not taken spiritual things as seriously as they should be taken. Another thing we are told as ministers of the gospel and leaders that uh, many need instruction on how, as to how they should appear in the assembly for worship on the Sabbath. They are not to enter the presence of God in the common clothing worn during the week. All should have a special Sabbath suit to be worn when attending service in God's house. While we should not conform to worldly fashions, we are not to be indifferent in regard to our outward appearance. We are to be neat and trim, though without adornment. The children of God should be pure within and without. That is Testimonies to the Church, Volume 6, page 355, paragraph 2. Now, you know, Aaron himself had uh, a special garment for ministering in the sanctuary. The ministers of the gospel, when they appear so untidy 
and with common clothing, tattered clothing, they show that they do not respect the sanctuary itself. And so the service of the Lord is made cheap by the way the ministers and leaders dress. And the same is passed to church members who see that uh, God is not to be respected in our dressing. But let us remember that thy ways, O God, are in the sanctuary. And even as the Levites and Aaron had a special garment for ministering, so also the leaders and the gospel ministers have special dresses to be worn on the Sabbath. God required them also to wash their clothes. That is the Levites. He is no less particular now than he was then. He is a God of order and requires his people now upon the earth to observe habits of strict cleanliness. And those who worship God with uncleanly garments and persons do not come before him in an acceptable manner. He is not pleased with their lack of reverence for him, and he will not accept the service of filthy worshippers for they insult their maker. The creator of the heavens and the earth considered cleanliness of so much importance that he said, and let them wash their clothes. This is coming from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 233, paragraph 2. We again read, neatness of grace and wearing of hearts. I am often pained as I enter the house where God is worshipped to see the untidy dress of both men and women. If the heart and character were indicated by the outward apparel, then certainly nothing could be heavenly about them. They have no true idea of the order, the neatness, and the refined deportment that God requires of all who come into his presence to worship him. What impression do these things give to unbelievers and to the youth who are keen to design and to draw their conclusions? In the minds of many, there are no more sacred thoughts connected with the house of God than with the most common place. Some will enter the place of worship with their hearts on, in soiled, dirty clothes. Such do not realize that they are to meet with God and holy angels. There should be a radical change in this matter all through our churches. Ministers themselves need to elevate their ideas to have finer susceptibilities in regard to it. It is a feature of their work that has been sadly neglected because of the irreverence in attitude, dress, and deportment, and lack of a worshipful, lack of a worshipful frame of mind. God has often turned his face away from those assembled for his worship. This is uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 498, paragraph 2 and paragraph 3. In uh, Manuscript Releases, Volume 3, page 234, paragraph 4, in entering the house of worship, you should remember that it is the house of God. Respect should be shown by the removal of the heart, remembering that you are entering into the presence of God and angels. You should teach the children reverence. Let honest efforts be carried forward to this end and remember that you are a temple of the living God. So um, God calls upon the ministers of the gospel and the leaders of the church to be on the forward in doing these reforms. When they do these reforms, they will have a telling influence upon the congregation. And then when God is worshipped in... Uh, in the beauty of his holiness, then he will find a way to minister to his children. Lastly, lastly, looking at the last words, we are told a minister who is negligent in his apparel often wounds those of good taste and refined sensibilities. Those who are faulty in this respect should correct their errors and may be more circumspect. The loss of some souls at last will be traced to the untidiness of the minister. God forbid that someone will be lost in heaven because the gospel minister was untidy when he came to minister the word. In that it affected him so much that he found the spiritual things of no value in his life. The first appearance affected the people unfavorably because they could not in any way link his appearance with the truth he presented. His grace was against him, and the impression given was that the people whom he represented were a careless set who cared nothing about their dress. And 
his hearers did not want anything to do with such a class of people. Here, according to the light that has been given me, there has been a manifest neglect among our people. Ministers sometimes stand in the desk with their hair in disorder, looking as if it had been untouched by comb and brush for a week. God is dishonored when those who engage in his sacred service are so neglectful of their appearance. Anciently, the priests were required to have their garments in a particular style to do service in the holy place and minister in the priest's office. They were to have garments in accordance with their work, and God distinctly specified that what this should be. The lava was placed between the altar and the congregation that before they came into the presence of God, in the sight of the congregation, they might wash their hands and their feet. What impression was this to make upon the people? It was to show them that every particle of dust must be put away before they could go into the presence of God. For he was so high and holy that unless they did comply with this condition, death would follow. Just imagine that, that the minister who appeared untidy before God did not wash his hands and feet before he went to minister in the sanctuary. When he went there, he was slain with the presence of God. But the ministers today will come in the presence of God and um, uh, they care about nothing, they're untidy, their hair is uncombed, their shirts are unbuttoned, their chests are out, and their arms are left bare. They are, they are almost naked, and they are almost as if they have never touched water and anything. This creates an impression that we serve a careless God. And people will never want to serve God in such a way, and they end up hating religion and gospel ministers and seeing that uh, these are very religious and uh, 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 uncaring people. And so uh, let us think about these things as we, we start thinking of uh, Sabbath reform. And uh, the teachers who are also the leaders of the church and gospel ministers, we are told that uh, <clears throat> every teacher in the Sabbath school should be a follower of Christ and those who have not identified themselves as the disciples of Christ, showing by a consistent life that they are Christian should not be invited to become teachers in the Sabbath school for they have need that someone first teach them the foundation principles of the love and fear of God. Without me, Christ says he can do nothing. Then of what value will be the teaching of one who knew nothing by personal experience of the power of Christ? It would be a great inconsistency to urge such a, a one to take a class in the Sabbath school, but it is even worse to permit a class to be under the influence of a teacher whose dress and deportment deny the savior whom he professes to serve. And so these things are so serious that God does not uh, mean his words upon them. Teachers and workers in every department of the Sabbath school work, I address you in the fear of God and tell you that unless you have a living connection with God and are often before him in uh, honest prayer, you will not be able to do your work with heavenly wisdom and win souls for Christ. The worker for God must be clothed with humility and with the agreement. The Lord will recognize and bless the humble worker who has a teachable spirit, a reverential love for truth and righteousness, wherever such a worker may be. If you are thus, you will show a care for your scholars by making special efforts for their salvation. You will come close to them in loving sympathy, visiting them at their homes, learning their true condition by conversing with them concerning their experience in the things of God, and you will bear them in the arms of your faith to the throne of the Father. This is uh, Cancels to Southern Work, page 75, paragraph one. And uh, uh, we see that um, the Lord is so careful on what should be done on the Sabbath and the teachers that uh, are to teach on the Sabbath school, that um, uh, it should be something that uh, should bring the awe and the presence of God in their means. What about price giving? on the Sabbath, Christ giving on the Sabbath. Again, we are told on Sabbath morning, Marshalltown, Iowa campground, August 16, 18, for, for a large company made for Sabbath school. 
Classes were soon arranged, including all except a few who chose seats outside the stand. But these were not left to themselves. Teachers were appointed and two or three interesting classes formed. All were as busy as bees and everywhere in the tent and out of it was heard the hum of voices. The school was well conducted and orderly and to me the exercises were very interesting. By request, I spoke about 30 minutes, warning them against letting their Sabbath school degenerate into a mere mechanical routine. We should not seek to imitate Sunday schools nor keep up the interest by offering prizes. The offering of rewards will create rivalry, envy, and jealousy, and some who are the most diligent and worthy will receive little credit. Scholars should not try to see <clears throat> how many verses they can learn and repeat, for this brings too great a strain upon the ambitions of child, while many verses they can learn and repeat, while the rest become discouraged. Try none of these methods in your Sabbath schools, but let superintendents and teachers make every effort to have life and interest in their schools. What a blessing it will be if all who teach as Jesus taught. He did not aim to attract attention by eloquent or by overwhelming grandeur of sentiment. On the contrary, his language was plain and his thoughts were expressed with great simplicity, but he spoke with loving earnestness. In your teaching be as near like him as possible. Then uh, as means, as means of intellectual training, the opportunities of the Sabbath are invaluable. Let the Sabbath school lesson be learned, not by a hasty glance at the lesson scripture on Sabbath morning, but by careful study for the next week on Sabbath afternoon with daily review or illustration during the week. Thus, the lesson will become fixed in the memory, a treasure never to be wholly lost. And so uh, we are told that um, the Sabbath school um, is a place not to give different gifts to children who are answering most of the question or who have a lot of uh, memory uh, verses. But uh, we should teach as Christ taught. And also the Sabbath school lesson should not be looked at hastily, but uh, it should be something that should be studied throughout the week and the people come to share the experiences and what they have learned during the Sabbath hours. And, um, also, one thing we read about the Sabbath school is that uh, controversy should be avoided. These are the things that uh, the leaders and the gospel ministers are to be careful about. While there is need of thorough investigation of the word of God, that pressure truth may be discovered and brought to light, we should be guided that the spirit of controversy does not control in our discussion of the Sabbath school lesson. In bringing out points upon which there may be a difference of opinion, the grace of Christ should be manifested by those who are seeking for an understanding of the word of God. There should be liberty given for a frank investigation of truth that each may know for himself what is the truth. Among the pupils of the Sabbath school, there should be a spirit of investigation that those who are old enough to design evidence may be encouraged to search for fresh rays of light and to appreciate all that God may send to his people. The light which God will send to his people will never appear unless there is a diligent searching of the word of truth. And so we are told that uh, let all controversies be avoided in Sabbath school and, and uh, uh, in uh, our services. And uh, also the preaching, when you read six, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 6, page 361, we are told that the preaching should be short and then time should be given to uh, 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 testimonies and testifying and uh, social Sabbath so that um, the people may be able to have an opportunity to praise their Lord through their testimonies. The devil hates so much about the testimonies because my experience will give strength to another person who's going through a hard time and their victory will inspire victory in me if I'm weak in some place. And so the preaching should be short and then let the precious life of the soul be given to him in consecrated service by giving testimonies, singing praises, having psalms, having exhortations, and this will make the Sabbath a delightful service. This will help people not to fall asleep, but everyone will participate. 
the Sabbath is called a holy convocation. A convocation is a meeting where people converse and have communion. And so it should not be left to one person to be speaking from morning to evening. And then he lords over other people some things they do not understand. He forces things in the concerns and in the minds of the people. Let everyone participate in the Sabbath by being given a time to testify for what the Lord is doing. And if there is no living preacher in the church, let one take hold of leading out and let there be time for prayers and the testimonies. And so, brothers and sisters, we find that uh, the Lord is calling us to do a Sabbath reform. The Lord is calling us uh, to do a Sabbath reform. And uh, in our own strength, we cannot accomplish that which uh, uh, the Lord uh, would want us to accomplish. He says, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. And so I'll read also something, the last quote that is in Evangelism, page 245, paragraph two, and then we can pray. We are told partnership with non-SDS or non-Seventh-day Adventists. Others who are well acquainted with the Bible evidence that the seventh day is the Sabbath enter into partnership with men who have no respect for God's holy day. A Sabbath keeper cannot allow men in his employ paid by his money to work on the Sabbath. If, for the sake of gain, he allows the business in which he has an interest to be carried on on the Sabbath by his unbelieving partner, he is equally guilty with the unbeliever and it is his duty to dissolve his, the relation. However much he may lose by so doing. Men may think they cannot afford to obey God, but they cannot afford to disobey him. Those who are careless in their observance of the Sabbath will suffer great loss. This is Evangelism, page 245, paragraph 2. You find that um, many people are in these groups, merry-go-round groups, these labor unions and all this stuff that um, conducts the table banking on the Sabbath. And uh, at the end of the day, he will share in the dividends of this table banking or merry-go-round. We are told that this is something that should be shunned. This is something that should be stopped because as they do that and they, um, they contribute money, even if they will not give you on the Sabbath day, but on the other day, but the money was contributed on the Sabbath, you share in their guilty because a business transaction has been done and you are part of it because the money is coming to you. And so let us be careful in which partnership, which businesses we will do so that we may not get involved in doing businesses that uh, we ourselves will be in church on Sabbath, but uh, other people will be involved in looking for money that they will give you in another day as a profit. And so may the Lord bless us. Uh, I know I have not exhausted everything in this eight-part series on a need for Sabbath reform. I have just laid some grounds and uh, we can continue learning every day and admonishing each other. Uh, an iron sharpens an iron. And uh, pray for me. I'll pray for you also that uh, we may not be part of the people who discredit the Sabbath, but we may keep our foot from the Sabbath and we may not speak of our own things. Otherwise, it has been a blessing going through this series of a need of uh, Sabbath reform. I pray that it has been a blessing unto you. And uh, until we get into another series, if you haven't watched the seven part, the other seven presentations, please do try to watch them. And I know that uh, there's some valuable information that uh, will uh, you will get in them. And uh, we, we shall keep praying that the Lord sets us on a right path and on that narrow road. Uh, because the broad is the way and many are on it. Narrow is the way and few do find it. We want to be on that narrow road, uh, whether we are called legalistics, whether we are called extremist or straight lesson people, it is better to do these things for the Lord than to find friendship with the people and at the end of the day, lose your soul. For what shall it gain? Uh, for what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? That is uh, the book of Mark chapter 8. I presume it is verses 36 and so. 
Blessed Sabbath, wherever you are and wherever you'll be watching this and uh, God be with you. Let us pray in uh, conclusion. Dear Father in heaven, we pray that the Holy Spirit may be able to bring an understanding to your people on these things that we have touched on. Where we have uh, erred and uh, fallen short of your glory, Lord, may you supply the need, may you cover the wrongs we have done, but uh, do not leave us to indulge in sinning and repenting, praying and sinning, because this is an, uh, this is an abomination unto you. Bless us this Sabbath, be with your children as they worship you in truth and in spirit. And Father, when you come and take your children, let us be part of this uh, small flock which you have prepared a kingdom for it. Your name be glorified and uh, may Christ have a place in our heart now and forevermore for his in, in his name. I pray these things. Amen.